All right, um, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining another Origins talk. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Debanjian Sengupta. Debanjian was uh, originally working on theoretical particle physics for his masters, but then switched to um, astronomy. I imagine because it's more fun in 2014. He got his PhD from the University of uh, Delaware, working with uh, Neil Turner at JPL and James McDonald at, uh, at Delaware. And is currently in a NASA postdoctoral program fellow at um, NASA Ames. And he'll share some of his uh, recent work with us today uh, on moderately volatile elements and how they behave in the early uh, solar nebula. I want to ask you again, uh, like previously, to uh, to hold on to your questions until the, the end. There will be a Q&A session after the talk. Um, yeah, enjoy today's talk. Okay, so uh, morning everybody and thanks for giving me this opportunity to talk about my research. Um, so I'm Devanjan Sengupta, currently working with Paul Estrada and Jeff Kazi at, at NASA Ames Research Center as an, as an NPP fellow. Um, so today I'll be discussing about uh, the depletion of moderately volatile elements by wind-driven mass loss in the early solar nebula. So, uh, so let's discuss something uh, at the, at the beginning about what, what this work is all about. So we are basically working in the interdisciplinary field of meteoritics and planet formation. So my background is planet formation, but for the last one year, I'm basically working on the meteoritic data and trying to find out uh, what kind of information this meteoritic data, this vast pool of data can give us about uh, the planet formation, especially uh, the, the history of the very early solar system or how things went back then. Uh, so when we talk about meteorites, uh, we basically envision this type of picture, some discrete rocks and uh, uh, from, from different parts of the, of, the, of, the, of the planet that came from outside. And uh, there are many different elements inside like the matrices, uh, pre-solar grains, like the chondrules and calcium aluminum. Uh, rich inclusions and all those things. And it is fascinating, uh, like how, uh, how these this discrete rocks can, uh, can give us some information about, uh, about the early solar system formation. Because uh, some of the very, uh, some of the histories of the very early times are actually imprinted. And these are, uh, most of them are very unmodified from their formation time. So, uh, this is like the big family. So all what I learned in last one year is that meteor, meteor, meteorites, the whole science is kind of an ocean. And I'm just scratching the surface right now, just learning every day bit by bit. But this is, uh, this is overall uh, like a classification of all the things that we have and even more. So we have mostly uh, chondrites, uh, and primitive achondrites and achondrites. So when we talk about chondrites, they kind of formed at a late stage and they did not uh, had aluminum 26, so they did not melt. Whereas achondrites are, are assumed to be formed kind of early when the solar system already had aluminum 26, so they are melted. But today we are going to discuss mostly about things uh, that related to uh, chondrites and there may be some, some evidences of these MV signatures in the achondrites, but these are very complex and I haven't got into that. But our discussion today will be based on the, this particular part of the total family. And the interesting thing is that uh, whatever happened during the formation stage, we can basically extract some information and constrain our formation model. So when we, when we, uh, when we simulate our disk, the protoplanetary disk, when we simulate planet formation, we can constrain what kind of physical situations was there uh, when things were forming based on what information these small rocks can give us or what, what kind of information we can extract from, this, from these rocks. So uh, now I will go to the problem. Uh, the problem, uh, before I start with the problem, it is important to say that, um, that uh, this, this problem is a longstanding one. Like, like uh, the scientists actually uh, saw this problem in early 1960s and 1970s, and they started thinking about it and it's still not fully solved. So we are not going to claim that we have solved it, 
but we got some very interesting results. And more interestingly, uh, our current research has opened up some very interesting avenues that we propose to do later on. So uh, before we start, so what are the moderately volatile elements? Uh, because when I talk to some of my uh, planet formation colleagues, many of them are not well aware of the moderately volatile elements because volatiles by the meteorists and volatiles by the planet formation people are kind of different. So uh, the idea is when you have the solar system and the nascent um, ball of gas, then the solar system cools and then uh, you have the gaseous component condense and they become solidifies depending on their condensation temperature. Now, by our materials which have very high condensation temperature condense first, followed by intermediate condensation temperature, followed by the volatiles. Now, any, when we say, we talk about moderately volatile element, we basically talk about elements that has condensation temperature between 1400 Kelvin and 650 Kelvin roughly, and the boundaries are roughly silicate and sulfur. So anything with a condensation temperature above 1400 Kelvin are the refractories, which includes aluminum, molybdenum, strontium, and all those things. And anything with a, uh, with a condensation temperature below 650 Kelvin are basically volatiles. And they also include super volatiles like carbon dioxide, like uh, H2O and all those things. Now, so, so when we talk about moderately volatile elements or MVEs, we basically talk about materials with condensation temperature between 1400 and 650 in a rough range. So now what is the problem? The problem is very well known for several decades and it shows that, okay, in chondritic meteorites, there is a depletion of these moderately volatile elements uh, relative to the depletion of SI. So what happens is if you plot the abundances of all those moderately volatile elements, they show a systematic trend of uh, systematic depletion trend according to their condensation temperature. So what does it mean? It means that as you go to the higher condensation temperature, the abundance increases. And as you go towards the lower condensation temperature, their abundance decreases. So what does it mean? It means that something happened in the very initial solar system formation phase that this signature was imprinted and then what we find today shows this kind of signature. Now, uh, it is important to note that it's not only the chondritic meteorites or not only the asteroids or something like that. It, this, this trend is very, uh, very prominent in all the inner solar system, including the terrestrial planets. Um, for example, in a plot uh, by Palme 2000, Palme 2001, they showed that even Earth has a similar depletion trend. Now in this plot, you can see that this is the same plot, basically the previous one from Cassin 2001, 96, uh, but this plot is plotted in a different way. So you can see the CM, CO and CV chondrites at the same time you have arc on the very right hand side. And you can see the, the abundances of the materials starting from aluminum to all the way to zinc and which include several like silicon, chromium, manganese, sodium, they are all MVEs. And they also saw a similar depletion trend. And given that arc mass is pretty big compared to the solar total asteroid belt. Um, Earth actually contains a huge mass. So we can say that, okay, this depletion trend was very subtle and this depletion trend was very definite uh, and, and something really went on in the very early stages of the formation. Now, when we talk about, let me go back to the previous slide once more. When we talk about, so this, this plot, when we talk about this, uh, this depletion trend and the systematic depletion in the moderately volatile elements, you can see there are some uncertainties in the, in the plot. And there, those uncertainties are basically from the temperatures, uh, condensation temperatures, because a, a, particular, a particular element, the condensation temperature is basically assumed uh, or, or, uh, co or considered or uh, condensation temperature is basically uh, found out based on which chemical composition they are in. So it means that, uh, uh, that whatever condensation temperature is assumed here for a particular material is based on the assumptions of the chemical composition and their oxidation state. But having said that though, we are not interested in this exact zigzag path that these moderately volatile elements follow. 
we are mostly interested what happens to the general first order trend of this uh, moderately volatile element. So what we are trying to reproduce is the trend, but not the exact path or exact curve. Now, as I said, this is not a new problem and people and scientists are actually talking about it and working hard on this problem for last several decades. So there has been significant amount of work done and some of them are very successful uh, in many ways. So uh, if we see just overall, what are the, the, the propositions first started by Anders 64, who said that, okay, you have uh, this depletion trend because uh, the, because of the mixing of two different kind of materials, one is volatile rich and one, one is volatile poor when the solar system was forming. And his idea was based on the fact that chondrules are volatile poor, which was not the case which was shown later on. Again, in 1977, Wei and Wasson and Wasson 1977 showed that, okay, incomplete condensation of the nebular gas as it cooled and dissipated may contribute to this depletion trend. Whereas in 2005, in, in, in more recently uh, said that, okay, this is not something related to, exactly related to the formation um, uh, or, the, or the evolution of the, in, of the early solar system, but it is more of a, more, more of a trend that was inherited by the, by the solar system from the parent molecular cloud. Now, uh, Palme 1988 and Palme and Boynton 1993, they already argues against the two component model and based on the fact that chondrules are not that volatile poor as Anders 1964 assumed. And Bland 2005, however, favors the incomplete condensation model. Now, apart from these works, there are two very significant and pioneering work and I'll discuss those two now. So the first one is the Cassin 96 and 2001. Uh, so, uh, Cassin actually did a, uh, an evolution model uh, with, with, the meteor, with the meteoritic facts and uh, solar system evolution, but, um, he, he had, but, but in his model, he didn't have any wind, he didn't have no diffusion or no particle drift. So he had two component model that the trap dust for the opacity and immobile planetesimals. And uh, so his whole idea was that planetesimals will trap these, uh, these uh, depleted volatiles as the, as the solar system is cooling and this whole inner solar system material is accreting fast into the star just by depleting the inner solar system and that imprints the depletion trend in the, in the, in the meteorites, in the chondrites. But uh, later on, so this was the first pioneering work in, in this problem in 96 and 2001, two papers. And then uh, there was Chesla 2008, who repeated the same Cassin-like model in, in the context of alpha model, because by then we already had a very well-established Sakura Sunaev alpha model disk. But he included several other things. He included migrated particles and inward drift. So, so particles which are growing bigger can actually drift inward. Uh, and, and he also included radial diffusion. Now, the main idea of, or, or in, in, a, in, a, in a very broad stroke will be that MVs are already trapped inside the planetesimals uh, in the form of solids and they remain hidden until the nebula cools down and the gas dissipates. So uh, one thing is important to point out is that Chesler 2008 and Cassin 96, 2001, the results are kind of similar. But there are certain problems that Chesla uh, 2008 pointed out, is that if this scenario has to hold, then the planetesimal formation has to be very early, like even before 500,000 years. But then we have two different distinct type of planetesimals. We already know that, that, that the meteorites we are talking about are the chondritic meteorites, and they do not show any evidence of melting. So what does it mean? It means that they were formed when the solar system was already depleted by aluminum 26. So they did not accrete any aluminum 26 or significant alum aluminum 26, which can contribute to um, significant amount of melting. And also from age dating, these chondrites are basically uh, confirmed that they formed from two to four million years after the CI CIs were formed. So the problem is that you have to 
form everything very early, which is in contrast with the meteoritic records we already have about these chondrites. Now, second thing about the Cassin, Cassin model that Chesla um, 2008 pointed out is that um, to have the Cassin model work, you have to have a very hot inner nebula. That is the whole inner nebula has to be at a temperature which is above the silicon condensation temperature, which is around 1400 to 1450 Kelvin. Now Haas et al. 2003 pointed out that, okay, if that be the case, then you should not see any pre-solar grains because we already see pre-solar grains, but pre-solar grains will not survive in those high temperature environments. So this is the context where we propose our hypothesis is that, okay, we say the early solar system was an open system. So it was not a chemically closed or dynamically closed system. It is an open system. So material can come into the system or material can go out irreversibly from the system. And then we uh, propose that, okay, MVs, it is possible that when MVs are lost in vapor phase through some kind of disc wings, and when they leave, they leave irreversibly and they do not come back to the disk, so they actually leave a very depleted inventory behind. And uh, the MVs, normally what happens is when you have a depletion, it is always possible that there will be bigger particles from the outer solar system that comes, in a, that comes inward and due to the radial drift, and they can actually nullify the depletion trend. Uh, but the MVs, which already escaped the disk, they can circumvent this, circumvent this transport problem. So this is what we are proposing um, in, in a cartoon uh, is that you have a disk wind and at the same time you have a temperature profile and then you have several evaporation fronts of the MVs. Now what is doing is, what idea is that disk wind is escaping, is actually taking away materials in the vapor form and at what point, at some point, which materials or which MVs are escaping the disk depends on uh, whether that particular MV, uh, the evaporation front lies inside or outside that particular region. So, um, so let's say somewhere between EF2 and EF3, only the, only the materials that have condensation temperature below, EF, uh, below EF3 will be uh, escaping the disk and anyone or any MVs that has a condensation temperature above EF3 uh, will not escape the disk. So, so the systematic depletion actually in our hypothesis depends on the radial temperature and the position, respective positions of the, of the evaporation fronts of the MVs. Now, so why do we think that it is advantageous? Uh, number one, as I said, that it is chemically, it is not chemically closed. So things that leave early, uh, they do not come back. And uh, in this case, you do not have to form planetesimal fast because what we are proposing is that you do not have to form the planetesimals, but you can form the planetesimal blocks very early, which are like small particles, chondrules, and many things. And then they were mixed in the inner solar system through turbulence and other mechanisms, maybe rapid expansion that was uh, kind of, um, uh, proposed by Nan et al. or Des et al. 2017. And when that happens, then those can be accreted by planetesimals in the late stage, forming two different clans. And they can also be, um, they can also be accreted by achondrites um, and, and subse uh, leading to subs uh, and subsequent melting. But we don't, go, we don't wanna go into that. But the whole point is that you do not have to make the planetesimals very early. You just have to make the building blocks and those building blocks will be distributed throughout the solar system by inward mix, by inward drift, by turbulence, by radial mixing. And then the planetesimals, when accreting these building blocks, the MV depletion trend will be imprinted in that. So that is our hypothesis. Now we start our uh, work by a global nebula model because as you can see that to, to, to um, uh, approach this problem, we need a model that includes this mass loss rate, that includes uh, all the MV spaces and their dynamical evolution along with the gas and solid growths and all those things. So we start with uh, 
a model that was presented by Estrada et al. 2016. And this is the basic model which had the evolution of the gas disk. That is the simple equation del sigma del T that actually comes from the conservation of mass and conservation of angular momentum of the, uh, of the disk material. And then we also have the advection diffusion of the particle and trace vapors. So they, they follow the drag here. Um, they, they follow sometimes the gas. They sometimes, um, uh, when they grow bigger, they get decoupled from the gas and they follow their own path and things like that. So many things happen. Uh, so the code basically captures that, that part as well. Now this code also, our numerical model, Estrada 16, also uh, uh, captures the solid growth. And, sol and the solid growth was actually done by the moment method. Now normally they're basically done, so you can see they're done by sol solving Smolchowski's equation in implicit integration method, like the, done by uh, Professor Dulemon's group, like Brin Steel et al. or Windmark et al. And also uh, sometimes they're done by Monte Carlo model, which are very expensive numerically, uh, which is done by Zom et al., sometimes done by me in my PhD. Um, but here the things are done in terms of a moment method, which is fast and which is much less computationally expensive. And the growth model basically includes sticking, bouncing, fragmentation, mass transfer. And it also includes the lucky particles, which are the migrators that can become big and that, is, that can be subjected to significant amount of radial growth. Now, uh, the, the other thing is the opacity calculation. Uh, the, so the model also calculates monochromatic opacities from the utilitarian opacity model of Kazi et al. 2014, that, that includes effective medium theory. And then the temperature is calculated from the radiative transfer, uh, which includes the viscous heating and stellar luminosity. And in this model, stellar luminosity is time varying. Now, normally the this evolution of the gas disk and advection diffusion of particle and trace vapors, this, these things are all done in 1D, but while calculating the, the radiative transfer, the disk is now, uh, uh, the disk is actually expanded to a one plus one D that is in the vertical direction. And then the temperature is calculated. Now, one novel feature of this model was the evaporation fronts inclusion. That is, um, you have certain evaporation fronts and, we, and the model tracks certain um, species uh, and whether that species, that a particular material is inside or outside the evaporation front depends whether that is in the solid or the vapor form and whether uh, it is in the vapor form, they follow the equation for the vapor, and whether it is solid, they follow the advection and diffusion uh, equation. Now, the thing is that this model was very state of the art, but to solve our problem or test our hypothesis, we needed something more. So we went for some updates. Number one, this update was done before me, that is the fractal growth and porosity. It's because as we all know that if you, if you include porosity of the particle and include fractal growth, the particles can actually grow significantly bigger. Uh, significantly bigger in a sense that it can grow significantly bigger, bigger before it experiences the inward drift. So particles also uh, uh, provides a higher uh, cross-sectional area for a larger cross-sectional area for gas drag. And typically, if you consider two particles of similar mass, the porous particles normally have one to two orders of magnitude higher Stokes number, uh, smaller Stokes number than the solid counterpart. Now, when I talk about Stokes number, it's basically a measure of how the dust particles are coupled to the gas. So that means what is the stopping time? So this is the T-stop. And if you multiply the stopping time by the local orbital frequency omega, just to make it a dimensionless parameter, which is Stokes number. So what we mean by Stokes number is actually how much the particle is coupled to the gas. Now, followed by the fractal growth and porosity, there was one important thing that we needed to do was updating the gas opacity. And that is because uh, when uh, we are going to test our hypothesis, we need to simulate our inner nebula, which is hot. So we need a consistent opacity model, which can uh, which can basically uh, give good result or, or uh, reliable result for the hot inner nebula. So what we did is we followed the prescription from Friedman et al. 2014 for the gas opacities and uh, the Rosaline and the Planck mean opacities 
are calculated from Friedman et al. model for of very high temperature, higher metallicities, and a wider pressure range. Uh, pressure range ranges from one microbar to 300 bar, and it also gives a closed form expression for a weighing function for temperatures up to 7,000 Kelvin. Now coming to the more important parts is coming is adding a disk wind model. Now we know that there are two uh, well-established disk wind model uh, in a 1D, uh, 1D scenario that is by 2016 and Suzuki et al 2016. Now these two models are kind of similar. They give similar results, but at the same time, uh, they parameterize their wind model in a different way. Now Bayes model are basically based on several um, uh, MHD local simulations that he ran before, like from 2010 to 2014. And that model is a direct generalization of Weber Davis 1967, which is basically a stellar wind model, which, which included for the first time rotation and the effect of magnetic fields. Um, now Bayes model is parameterized in terms of the magnetic field strength and also the magnetic field geometry. Uh, but he mentioned in his 2016 B paper in a, in, a, in a 1D evolution, global evolution model paper, that his wind model tends to be a little bit less reliable for higher temperature. Suzuki et al. on the other hand is the same as motivated by several MHD simulations. And uh, it, it depends on some assumptions like where from your wind is being launched. And it also calculates a torque that the, that the escaping disk wind exerts on the disk. And mass flux is estimated based on the energetics. So what is the total gravitational energy or um, the, uh, like um, the, the balance between the total gravitational energy, radiative energy loss, and the energy which is going to the wind. Um, and this model is basically parameterized in terms of the mid-plane values. And that is basically done in terms of three parameters. Now we choose here the Suzuki et al. model, not because we think one is better or the other one is not that good, uh, but for our model, because we do, not, uh, we do not model things explicitly in terms of the magnetic field. And although we have certain magnetic field um, information from the meteoritic standpoint, like Fu et al. 2014, uh, gave some estimate of the magnetic field imprinted in the meteorite. meteorite. Uh, we kind of found it useful or more um, convenient to use Suzuki et al. model because it, it, it parameterized the wind model in terms of parameters that is very easy to implement in our, in our code. So, so what it does is it actually uses three parameters, C, W, zero, I'm, I'll come, come to that later, and one alpha phi Z, that is the torque, and uh, torque exerted by the escaping wind on the disk, and the epsilon, which is um, the amount or the fraction of the energy that is responsible for the wind mass loss. And um, he also had a torque, which this, this alpha phi z torque, which is a function of the surface density. Now, uh, the typical mass loss range you can, you can see from this figure, this figure is directly taken from uh, Suzuki et al. 2016, um, that these uh, different cases where the strong disk wind uh, weak disk wind with sigma dependent torque or zero torque. And uh, here the major differences is all between 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 AU. So you can see the differences are very close to the start, like 0 0.01 AU. But as you go beyond 0 0.4, 0 0.5 AU, that is the starting point of our simulation, the differences are not that big. So uh, what you, when we implement the wind term, uh, what you get is this equation, which is the diffu diffusion equation for the gas, plus a sigma dot term, that is the escaping wind mass, plus you get an additional term for the wind torque that you get while calculating the angular momentum from the wind component. Now, what are the different parameters, like the values of the parameters? Now, surface, the surface density dependent torque that Suzuki et al. used varies like 10 to the power minus five. And similar values have been used by other papers. By 2013 also use similar values of alpha phi z between 10 to the power minus five, a little higher 10 to the power minus three. And it was negatively dependent on plasma beta. And by the way, by 2013 also got a similar uh, power law for surface density with exactly 0 0.66 power law index in terms of the magnetic field strength. Now, typical values of CW0 is 10 to the power minus five in several watts. Now, what does it mean? It means CW0 actually converts your um, 
your local wind launching parameters in terms of the midplane value. So when CW0 is 10 to the power minus five, that means the wind is launched from a height where your pressure, your density, and other things are, are like the sound speed are basically 10 to the power minus five, especially the density is 10 to the power minus five times that of the midplane at the same radial point. So CW0 basically converts everything in terms of a midplane value. And epsilon is 0 0.9, which is the weak disk wind, which is a part of the total energy that goes to the wind launch. Now, uh, here we start with the wind model, but we do not include any torque. Uh, so we start with the no torque assumption, and I will come later when we will discuss the results, like why we are not using the torque. Um, the last thing is the adding MV spaces. Now, Cassin et al. had like 26 spaces uh, between 1450 and uh, 650 Kelvin. Uh, those are the moderately volatile elements. So we haven't chose all, chosen all of them. So we picked up like 11 spaces and the spaces are picked up so that their condensation temperature has a fairly um, good amount of differences in the, temp in the respective temperatures. Uh, so that these evaporation fronts actually do not belong to the same um, radial grid point, at least initially. Now we cannot uh, ensure that as the simulation goes on, because then the temperature changes, the disk cools down, and uh, this, uh, it is not possible to continue with this assumption unless we are using an, an, an adaptive grid uh, mesh refinement or adaptive grid technique. Uh, but we do not have that right now. So we choose that at least initially they do not fall like the evaporation ponds of uh, of two spaces do not fall in the same radial grid and these abundances are calculated directly from Lauder et al 2003 uh, the data given in their paper so now we are going to discuss the results like the initial results the fiducial model and then what we have got um, after that. So first, the fiducial model, we have taken alpha. Now this alpha is 10 to the power minus 3 is the Sakura Sunaive alpha. Now we have taken CW0 of 10 to the power minus 5, and this is the fractal growth. So you can see the on the left-hand side picture is the wind mass loss rate as a, as a radial variation. So wind loss is kind of 10, up to 10 AU, you have a slightly varying wind mass loss, like a, a, a small slope, and then it falls up rapidly after 10 AU. And on the right hand side, we get the MV fractions. Um, MV fractions in terms of their relative abundances of, of SI. And the lower curve is 0 0.5 AU, and the upper one is a 2 AU. And this dotted, uh, this dashed uh, uh, blue point, blue uh, lines are for, for the reference for CM, CO, and CV chondrites that is taken from um, Cassin's. Uh, plot that I showed earlier. Now, uh, what happens is, so this is at, uh, uh, so, th so we can see that as the wind is, uh, the, 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 this material is escaping through this wind, there is a depletion trend that is going on for alpha 10 to the power minus three and a minimal mass loss rate of 10 to the power minus eight. So this is the wind mass loss rate. Now, if we just take a, uh, surface density depend, surface density weighted average, then it looks like this. So the uh, solid curve is at 15,000 years, uh, the same one that I showed earlier. Um, but then if we, if we let the uh, simulation go at 35,000 years, you see that the depletion trend is, is being nullified. And why is that? You can see the temperature profile on the right hand side, and there are two uh, horizontal, horizontal dashed black lines. And those lines are the evaporation front temperature of the silicate and SI. So that is the two extreme ends of the MVs that we are considering. Um, so as you can see that uh, when at 35,000 years, the temperature is going down, so the disk is cooling. So uh, the, the, the temperature of the, even the innermost radius is actually going below the SI condensation temperature, fine. So that is why the SI is not escaping anymore. So you can see that on the left hand side of, of, of the plot, like towards the SI and nickel, what's happening is that the, part, the, the curve is getting flatter. And at the same time, the particles are getting bigger on the outer radius and they are now, uh, they are now drifting inward. 
And so when they are drifting inward, they are actually nullifying the depletion trend on the lower, lower temperature NGs as well. So what we are seeing is that if we are using a nominal mass loss rate, and if we are using alpha 10 to the power minus three, which is kind of a typical value of alpha in the inner disk, then um, the depletion trend starts, but uh, the depletion trend starts to nullify even before reaching the desired level. So what happens if we just increase the alpha? So here is a more turbulent um, disk, and the mass loss rate is like five times the fiducial model, so five times more than the previous one. And as we can see that, the deep, that there is never any depletion. So the 10,000 years and the 40,000 years, the depletion trends are same. And why is that? So if you see the temperature profile on the right-hand side, you can see that everything between two to 2.5 or three AU, um, the temperature is always uh, above, uh, above the evaporation front temperature of sulfur. So that means all the MVs are in the vapor form. So whatever disk wind is bringing it with it contains all the MVs in the vapor form in their uh, respective abundances. So we are not seeing any depletion trend uh, with alpha 10 to the power minus two. So the point is that with a higher alpha, the disk is not cooling fast enough. Uh, so we are not getting this trend. So the, the depletion trend actually just stays flat. Now, what happens if we decrease the alpha? And so alpha 10 to the power minus four and with the same wind mass loss and the radial profile as the fiducial model. So you can see that the temperature at 10,000 years and 50,000 years, even 90,000 years are very low. So if you start with the blue curve here on the right hand side at 10,000 years, the, the temperature of the innermost radii is already below the silicon evaporation front and even uh, kind of, uh, including nickel and chromium as well. So what happens here is these elements are never in the vapor form. They never escape through the disk wind. And so they never get depleted. But when, when 90,000 years plot on the left-hand side, you can see that uh, it all becomes flat because all the temperatures, the, the whole inner solar system temperature until, until um, uh, including the very inner uh, grid point actually has gone below the sulfur evaporation front temperature. So nothing is happening here drastically. So here the nebula cools down too fast. So temperature goes below all the MVs evaporation front. So we are not getting any model here or any depletion trend here. So what about a high mass loss rate? So what we are going to do is, okay, the disk is uh, cooling, cooling, but at the same time, what we are anticipating is that it is not losing mass fast enough. So how about we use a high mass loss rate and so that, because, so that the MV signatures uh, can be depleted even before the inner nebula can cool. And also the depletion signature, uh, it must be achieved before the inward drift, significant inward drift, drift takes effect. So what we did is we just put a higher mass loss rate. And here, the fun thing is that when we use the Suzuki et al model, it is very hard to get this kind of high mass loss rate with, with parameters that is physically re realistic. For example, to get a 10 to the power minus six mass loss rate, you need to have an alpha phi z 10 to the power minus one, or you need to have a CW zero of the order of 10 to the power minus four. What does it mean? CW zero of 10 to the power minus four means that your wind is being launched uh, from two, a, two uh, scale height above the mid plane at the very inner radii. Now that is absurd because that, that actually demands a significantly higher penetration depth for cosmic rays and solar uh, X-rays uh, for the ionization. And the second thing is what happens to the alpha? Yes, there are certain points where Suzuki et al got alpha, um, alpha tau, that is the torque term 10 to the power minus one, but not at t equals to zero. Remember that their constant alpha term was 10 to the power minus four, but as the, as the sigma was depleting two orders of magnitude or more, that sigma dependent term was increasing the torque. But what we need here is a higher alpha, alpha tau z, that is the higher torque um, at the very t equals to zero state, which is hard to justify. So what we do is we just take the same radial profile and artificially increase the, the mass loss rate. 
But in doing so, now we are doing something very drastic. We are saying that, okay, now this mass loss rate basically loses all the wind character. And now we are dealing with more of a generic mass loss term and not this wind anymore. So it's more of a mass loss. We do not know the origin. Uh, we do not know how to explain it in terms of any established disk wind theories. Um, but let's see what happens when we use this kind of mass loss rate with the same radial profile. Now, this is- Luanjan, sorry, sorry to yeah. interrupt. There was, um, I noticed there was a question in the, in the chat from uh, Neil on the plot you showed on the previous slide. Uh, uh, he asks whether the, the mass loss rate here, the plot is uh, cumulative or whether the units uh, should be mass per time per, per area. Um, no, it's like the solar masses per year at a particular grid point. So it's not cumulative. It's like um, the, the integration from R equals to R in to that particular radius. So, so uh, what happens is Suzuki et al. basically gives the mass loss from R equals to R to R infinity. So they integrate it. And what we do is we take the annulus and we integrate it between the two annulus uh, multiplied by two pi r times the area, and that's our mass loss rate. And we we actually found that these two gives kind of the same same similar results. Okay, thanks for thanks for uh, clarifying. Was that was that uh, all right, Neil? Uh, I think so. He he writes so it's it's mass per time per radius interval. That is right. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I cannot actually close the chat. Okay. So with that mass loss, now we are going back to the fiducial model. So on the left-hand side, this is the individual radial profiles of the MVs, 0.5 AU and 2 AU between the, the lowermost curve is 0.5, the uppermost is 2 AU. And when we again do the density integrated, um, density weighted integration in the inner solar, inner nebula, the right-hand side curve shows that, okay, it actually fits very well. And the more important thing is that it takes us 5,000 years. So it's just a high mass loss rate in a splash of time. Um, and we get the signature. And this signature stays for about 20 to 30,000 years. Now what happens if we do the same thing uh, in case of the lower alpha? Because we know that in the higher alpha case, the temperature doesn't cool down fast enough. So we don't get any depletion, but we can check the thing um, in, in, in 10 to the power minus four case. And when we do that, we get um, something like this, the green curve. So it's still not doing the, the same thing um, as was expected, but what happens if we increase the mass loss rate even more? So we increase the mass loss rate by one order of magnitude uh, from the previous one, and then we got the red curve. Uh, so what happening is that we have to get this, to get the signature, we have to get a mass loss, which is fast for a short interval of time. And um, this is fascinating because um, this is something we never envisioned when we started this work. And uh, so, so what are the conclusions? So this is, what are the conclusions that we come from all these results? And the more interesting thing that we found is that it actually opened a whole new avenue, which is fascinating um, for us to work with based on the results we have got here. So if I talk about the takeaway points um, from here is that the, we assume that the solar nebula as, as a dynamically open system and uh, the volatile loss, volatiles was lost through the disk winds is irreversible and it leaves a deplete, depleted inventory behind. So even if the planetesimals building blocks are forming, they do not have the signature again, uh, dip, uh, inflated. Um, number three is a typical wind mass loss rate is unable to reproduce the depletion signature um, as we saw in the fiducial case. And at the same time, if we increase the mass loss rate by two orders of magnitude or even more, then um, we can actually get the desired trend. But at the same time, as I mentioned, that it is very hard to explain those uh, mass loss rate uh, using the parameters of established disk wind models. Now, because as we saw previously that the, there is always an effect of the inward drift, like particles grow bigger and they are more prone to radial drift, and they have always the 
the, the, the ability to nullify this depletion signature, um, porous particles always work better uh, compared to their solid counterparts. And the more important thing is that this doesn't look like uh, look like a typical disk wind or a constant disk wind thing, but it's more like an outburst of young stellar object FU or type events. And having said that though, now we go to the future thing that we already started planning and proposing. So, um, uh, Devajan, before you move on to future work, uh, Andrew Uden had a question in the chat about the, the fast depletion of MVEs. Um, so, he asks, uh, isn't 20 to 30,000 years too short? Isn't the goal to explain million year time scale depletion? Uh, uh, okay, so, okay, can you see my slide actually? No. Oh, I think I lost it. I think you're going to need to screen share again. Uh, there can we you go. see it now? Okay. Yeah, um, so, the, so the question is, uh, yeah, so, if you see Chesler 2008, he actually, um, he actually uh, presented the result at a million year. Uh, but our uh, hypothesis says that, okay, we do not have to wait all, until all the planetesimals forms, but what we are trying to do is, um, uh, is making the planetesimal building blocks. And then we rely on the disk mechanisms to, to mix all those, all those building blocks uh, all through the uh, solar system to radial mixing and turbulence and things like that. Now, definitely 20 to 30 years is short, but what are, we, are, we are trying to achieve is at least 100 to 200,000 years to, to keep the signature. But even if we get a signature for a short time, um, even we can make uh, building blocks like chondrules and other things in, in, in those uh, phases. So yes, definitely it is a point that we have to run this longer and we have to make sure that this depletion trend uh, stays for at least 100,000 years. But um, because we do not want to, uh, because we do not uh, hypoth hypothesize that, that those building blocks were accreted by planetesimals first, and because the chondrites formed already two to four million years after the CIs, um, so we just need to make the building blocks, not the planetesimals. All right, thanks. Uh, so we are not, we do not have the plan to go for million years, but definitely a hundred thousand years. Yes. Um, so can I go ahead? Yeah, please do. Okay. Um, so uh, having said that though now, this is, so if we go to, um, if we stop here, and then uh, the, the important thing is that uh, the whole point uh, pointed us towards uh, a, a very innovative way of looking at these things. That is, um, that is the layered accretion. Okay, so we are looking for uh, high mass loss rate uh, for short amounts of time, which is hard to justify from a disk wind scenario. But wait, we have another way of doing that, and that is layered accretion and outburst. So if we see um, Zhu et al. model, who did a 1D2 zone model of the layered accretion thing, he got those initial outbursts. And you can see the picture here that he actually got uh, MV, uh, the mass loss rate of 10 to the power minus 4 and several flashes of them when this disk was being built from, the, from zero. So here's the red card is this is our plan to start a simulation uh, with, a, with a layered accretion model that we, are, uh, we have started discussion about how to implement that in our model and so on and so forth. So our plan is to actually go um, according to Zhu et al's signature of 1D2 zone model where the upper layer will be MRI active, huge mass loss uh, rate true accretion, um, uh, short splashes of mass loss, uh, high mass loss rate, and we do not want to include all of them like Zhu et al here actually uh, built, built up the disk from the scratch. We do not want to do that. What we want to do is, uh, let's say starting at this red vertical line that is uh, uh, capturing maybe one, two or a few of those outburst uh, scenarios and then check what happens. Because, um, uh, uh, because even if um, you have this layered accretion model, the main advantage is that uh, you can still have accretion where the, where the particles can grow 
in the mid plane unhindered by the turbulence of the layer accretion and the second thing is that there is an infall thing which is not included in our model yet so what does it say is that um, our model is not yet complete is because infall was certainly going on in the inner in the in the early solar system phases and um, so we need to include infall and to check that whatever depletion signature we have is this robust and so uh, this is the main two things that we are proposing in next two three years um, of working and we are actually looking for a unified global evolution model which will have disk winds presumably shut down or shut off or on depending on what kind of physics we're going to uh, simulate uh, and we will have infall and the layered accretion and based on uh, the same thing based on this temperature gradient uh, whether we can get the same kind of mb depletion signature um, without the disk wind and just based on the layer accretion so i will stop here and uh, i will take questions and also we haven't yet submitted this paper we are still writing it um, so any suggestions and comments will be highly appreciated um, so thank you very much All right, thank you so much. Uh, if you have questions for Devajan, please raise your hand in the participants tab. Uh, alternatively, if you can't unmute right now, you can put your question in the chat and I will read it. Um, so it looks like I see another question from Neil Turner. Uh, first of all, he says, thank you for the nice talk. The question is, how does the model treat solid particles internal structure? Uh, for example, is fragmentation equally likely to break off pieces of all compositions? Um, I think it's done in a more um, uh, averaging way. Uh, but so Dr. Paul can, can tell us more about it because photos particle implementation was done before I joined as an NPP and, and took the code. Uh, but what I know is that it's more of an averaging method. Um, and uh, so, so, uh, so what happens is that you have the fractals, you have the particles going big, and when the fragmentation happens, it just happens uh, with, with all the particles similar, but depending on where you are. Um, so let's say you have the water ice, you have uh, the silicates, and all kind of combined in the fractal model. And when you, when you are uh, having a fragmentation event, uh, then, uh, when you are having a fragmentation event, then basically uh, they just they are just broken into several monomers of different materials. So that's my understanding of the porous model. All right. Next question is from Andrew Uden, who asks, "How did CI chondrites avoid depletion?" Yeah, that that's actually a good question. Um, uh, so let me think, because what we discussed before is that. Um, the CI chondrites have kind of solar system like um, solar system like uh, um, uh, composition. So their abundance is similar to the solar. Uh, and so what happens is um, what we think is that if this happens, then the CI chondrites um, basically can be formed by the late, by the particles that was growing uh, without that uh, in the solid form because what we are we are losing through the disk wind is basically the vapor form, and when the disk cools, uh, when the disk cools down, uh, they still have these uh, solid things intact, uh, also coming from the outer radius, outer outer uh, part of the disk, and I think that is how the the uh, this thing the the CI chondrites uh, are formed. But I'm not too sure about it because I have to really think about it and we can discuss it later because I think we had this discussion before, but not, uh, I did not quite get the full picture of having CI chondrites um, avoiding the depletion and having the solar composition. I'm, I'm sorry for that, but it's definitely something I need to look at. All right, uh, Steve, do you want to unmute? Hi. Yeah, thank you. This was a really fascinating talk. I, I like all the elements that are included in here. Um, I actually have a lot of questions but, uh, about CI, chondrites, about the infall, but I'm going to stick to um, one, which is you said at the beginning that you, uh, you, you think chondrules are not that volatile poor, but most of the depletion patterns 
can be attributed to uh, varying amounts of, of chondrules. And so CI chondrites have no chondrules and CV have a lot of chondrules. And, and so for the most part, you know, the amount of chondral versus matrix uh, determines this volatility trend. So can you elaborate on that? Why don't you think chondrules is, is oh, just- No, it's actually not that I think it was, I think it was, uh, it was presented by, uh, argued by, May 2000 or some uh, let me let me see let me just um, go back to the mm -hmm. yeah you said Palma 1988 and Palma yeah yeah so he actually argued that volatiles may not uh, chondrules may not be that volatile poor um, but definitely what you said is later on there are both there are both uh, evidences there are evidences for both volatile weak and poor chondrules it's like uh, there is no chondrules in the CIs and things like that or there is like a very little chondrules in the, in the CM chondrites and things like that. So, yeah, so it's not, uh, uh, so it's not very clear to me because this like a huge flurry of meteoritic data, I'm still yet to grasp all of them. Um, but this is something that Paul Metal basically um, uh, argued on the line that he argued against Anders 1964. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, next question is from Alaria Piscucci in the chat. She says, thanks for the nice talk. Can you comment on the assumption of zero wind torque? Would your results change by changing this parameter and how? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, we just had a long discussion yesterday in our group uh, on that. So how we are going to explain that? So the question is, yes, if you see uh, Suzuki et al plots, there is huge differences um, uh, of this, there is huge differences of, let's say, surface density and mass loss rates and other things when you include the torque and when you don't include the torque. But all those differences are like at 0 0.02 AU. And when you go up to 0 0.3 or 0 0.5 AU and outside that, you basically do not have um, that much differences. Now, we are not simulating anything uh, that is 0. Um, 0 to AU or anything, because that is pretty much in the magnetosphere of the, of the sun. And who knows what happened there? Like it's so complex with, with entangled magnetic fields and things like that. So when our simulation starts at between 0 0.3, 0 0.5 AU, uh, Suzuki et al. plot clearly shows that the differences are not that much. Uh, but definitely we are including that, that term. It is, it is very easy to include because it's like a constant term in the, in the gas velocity. And uh, we are including that term, uh, and we are aware that this may uh, increase the inward radial drift of the particles because you are actually adding a separate term with the with the gas velocity, so the particles can can experience more drift. Um, but other than that, uh, if you say like which model we are going to follow, Suzuki et al. also have a model like weak disk wind with zero torque. Um, so uh, we are basically following that. So we, we this queen with zero torque. And there is another point is that when you are using a high mass loss rate, uh, that high mass loss rate, Suzuki et al showed that when your mass loss rate is high, your, your uh, accretion due to the wind torque becomes low because you do not have less, we do not have enough material to accrete um, apart from the wind. And so in that case, we are even using two orders of magnitude more mass loss rate. And the more important thing is we tried to come up with uh, that higher mass loss rate using uh, several other parameters, using a parameter combination from Suzuki et al. But it was very hard to actually explain uh, those parameters. For example, we had to use like a 10 to the power minus one, 0 0.1 torque term for the phi Z stress. And that was absurd because uh, then it will, if we add that term into our accretion uh, module, then it will just create a, create a gap in a very short time. So we have excluded that thing for now. And definitely we are working on that to include, to compare what happens when we include the torque and when we do not. All right, uh, so uh, Steve just dash comments on top of that, that they also favor the Suzuki et al. weak disc winds uh, in their 2018 paper. Uh, next question is from Neil Turner asking, what processes could have 
would have to be added to reproduce the depletion curves element by element sawtooth shape. Yeah, yeah, we actually thought about it because uh, our our interest was that okay, there may be other po possible theoretical ways that we can get that depletion trend, but at the same time, if we can confirm, um, if we can confirm uh, that those are already there, uh, the signatures are there at least for some elements in the escaping wind or in the outflows, then it can basically um, establish the fact that okay, the volatiles are being MVs are being lost through these queens. But then we talked to Uma, Uma Goti, who is an expert of these things in our group. And according to her, uh, that is very hard with the current resolution and with the abundances that we gave her uh, to actually see uh, uh, those, those uh, signatures in the outflowing this queen. So no hope for now, at least. <laughs> All right. Um, so Jeff, did you want to ask a question or is, um, did you just want to, uh, share your comment in the chat? I just sent a comment out in answer to Steve's question, uh, which is that, uh, maybe other people might not have seen it though. Uh, there was a paper by Phil Bland et al in which they looked at matrix actually in five or so different chondrite groups. And so even the matrix is MVE depleted to different degrees. So this idea of Deander's idea, I, I, may, I don't know if you were supporting that, but that idea apparently is not gonna work. Okay, um, Sebastian. Yeah, I had, a, I had a question about the, or I guess Steve wants to respond maybe to, to Jeff's response to Steve. Oh, yeah, if I'm allowed. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's difficult when we're translating between fields um, and, and what the meteoritists argue about and, and what the astrophysicists argue about it. It's somehow, um, and I need to get up to speed on this too, this issue, but um, I think the overall trend has to be that chondral formation takes volatiles out of chondrules and puts them in the matrix. That's, that's an overall trend, which explains most of what we see. But I, I allow that um, there's probably still some leftover uh, second order effects, I, I might call them, that, that are not explained that something like this model, if the matrix is depleted, yeah, that's the part you have to explain. But, but overall, the difference between different chondrites is, is almost certainly due to chondrules versus matrix, I would think. Um, so just, just uh, if you, if you, if you please, can you please um, comment on the on the composition of the CI that uh, Dr. Yudin asked? Oh, I think that CIs are are um, they just form very far out in the disk, and yes. so they they simply did not mix with a a region that had been depleted of, of other things. Yeah, so I think I think I was right in I was in the same line that they actually came out later from outside uh, when yeah. the volatile loss was already done. Yeah. But I also don't think there was a lot of infall either, uh, which is a separate issue. But um, I think I think the disk formed and then it stopped having infall within a hundred thousand years. Um, so it's not like there's it's been replenished. It's just simply not evolving very much in the outer disk. Yeah, and when what we found is that the infall model there are huge uncertainties. Like um, you 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 just differ. You just change things by zero point five, and your infall radius, the, the critical radius and the infall rate changes by orders of magnitude. But, um, but actually it's not that, it's, it's the fact that the sun formed in a high mass star forming region and therefore was one of these exposed prop lids within a hundred thousand years and there's nothing to infall from. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, right. Yeah. So I had, a, I had a different question. I was wondering about the, the, the details of the, the one plus one, one D model, basically. Uh -huh. um, and the question then is, do you, do you, f I mean, I guess at every radius, you have a grain size distribution from the moments method, right? That is right. Yeah. So I was wondering whether you force the uh, solid composition to be the same across that size distribution or whether the, the large grains can be a little bit different from the smaller ones, but yeah. I think the large. I think there is a composition. So, um, so, so the model actually includes like organics, refractories like iron and silicon and things like that, and uh, they are mixed uh, according to their abundances in the grain size. So, when I talk about, let's say, when we talk about a large grain, that includes everything. 
if it is beyond the evaporation front of all those materials yes even water ice right right but then i mean the larger grains move move differently from the from the small grains right the, the smallest yeah, one right so let's say when a larger grain is crossing past the ice uh, evaporation front then it loses the ice in the vapor form in the water vapor and it leaves with um, the other refractories okay all right uh next question is in the chat from neil turner are the escaping NVEs potentially detectable in outflows? What special outflow and gas phase molecule or dust mineral species should we look for with ALMA or JWST? Oh, I think we already had that question. Is that right? I thought we hadn't answered that one yet, but I could be wrong. Oh, it's, uh, um, it's actually the, the thing that I was mentioning that UMA's, UMA thinks that with the abundances and with this, um, with the current um, resolution that we have from both Alma, Alma and what we are going to have with JWST, it okay. probably is very difficult. But as Paul mentioned that we have seen P, but we discussed that and there was certain problem with that, for, with that uh, phosphorus uh, detection, uh, whether it was actually from the wind or from the upper layer of the atmosphere. Uh, there, was, there was certain um, uh, ambiguities with that. So, so it, it's good not to like comment on record on that. <laughs> All right. Um, there also seems to be a, a lively discussion going on in the chat about chondral matrices. Um, I don't know if this is, is something that uh, the participants want to get uh, Devijan's input on as well? Or are you happy talking amongst yourselves? Oh, when these guys Steve, are talking, maybe. I'm very happy to just uh, <laughs> be a bystander. <laughs> <laughs> Steve would like to comment, I guess. Uh, sure. Um, uh, yeah, chondral and matrix, it, sh it should be said. Chondrals are the millimeter size uh, igneous spherules. Matrix is the micron size dust that, that binds them all together. So chondral and matrix, they have this complementarity uh, where matrix has volatiles that chondrals lack. And when you put them together in different chondrites, you know, they add up to a more universal common composition. So that's the issue. And, and um, it is observed and it's, it's wondered whether it happens in the meteorite, like it's mixed between the things, or if it happened before the meteorites were assembled, a uh, nebula. And um, I can see what, what's going on is, is that, yes, we agree that is something that happens in the nebula. There's some, you know, you heat up chondrules and they lose volatiles. So of course, it, and they go to dust, which has the surface area. So that happens. We all agree. We're debating, Jeff and I, on um, how much that's important relative to the overall depletions. And it's, it's been very interesting to see that. All right. Well, I don't think that's uh, something that we can solve in the next couple minutes. Um, so <laughs> let's go ahead and end here. Um, I'd like to invite everyone to unmute and thank our speaker for an excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you.